Welcome to Generous Theology, with Chuck and Brock. The fellows are talking today from Chapter 19, by Professor Cecilia Trefogli, from the book, The Cambridge History of Medieval Philosophy. What was that one song, Changes? <laughs> that appropriate to our topic. <laughs> yeah, I was going to I was gonna segue into that. Uh, that's one of my favorite songs. Yeah. But we have a really interesting little bit of conversation today. We're reading together this excellent chapter 19. Cecilia Trifogli, I'm not sure if I'm quite saying that correctly. But for me, Chuck, this chapter is interesting and crucial because it comes down to one of the primary distinctions in the Middle Ages in philosophy. So this chapter is awfully important in terms of talking about such things. And there's a lot of meat in here. And so it's really great to think about this idea of change. So change considers motion, change in being. There's also aspects of time and place that are represented here. Think of the ideas of context, if that sounds good. And so you're trying to philosophically, you're trying to put a very complicated principle into as small and concise package as possible. And I want to just throw out, Chuck, at the very beginning, that it's not clear to me that the philosophers have succeeded. In other words, there's no satisfactory definition for what change is that has any sort of precision to it. You have to abstract away. And when you abstract away, you introduce some abstractions. Big surprise there. But you introduce some abstractions that are really controversial. So change, in fact, might not have an easy answer. And this relates to some of the issues of causality that we talked about previously in the chapter by Kukkonen. And so I just wanted to throw out to you, maybe before we get into the chapter content, what, if anything, had you thought about in terms of, had you ever maybe wrestled with ideas of change or problems of change in a philosophical sense? And and if not, how did it hit you when you were coming through and reading this for the first time? And if so, how did this mesh with where you'd come from? Yeah, so I, I think I have a couple of thoughts here. One is just thinking about change and what is it and how does it work? And like you, I'm a science fiction guy and I, I have enjoyed reading science fiction since I was a kid. And there is a there's a genre of science fiction that I really enjoy called alternate history and combines both sort of the sci-fi piece along with sort of the, the history piece that, that I enjoy as well. And, and it's interesting because even within different writers of alternate history, there are different ideas of change and, and what changes and what would it mean to have multiple timelines and that kind of thing. And so having read authors with somewhat different concepts and, and maybe they don't keep those concepts entirely up front in their writing, although some do, you quickly notice the difference between people who see, for example, timelines as a tree where there's a branch off with each change so to the point where you just get billions and trillions and quadrillions of possible worlds because everything is another branch. To other people who see things intertwining and come back together, or timeline as being naturally wanting to head in a particular direction, and there may be changes within it as you go. And a lot of my thinking about change has been in that context. And so has a lot of it has been about time, which obviously we'll get to uh, in the, the second part of this chapter. The other thing, though, that and, and really as uh, in the first part of this chapter, the ontological status of change, what really struck me as I was reading through this is we, as you pointed out, we have medievals have a, a significant difference in how do they see change? What is the ontological status of change? Is change something in and of itself? Or uh, is it more of a property that, that, like on page 268, it talks about how there's common agreement that you need degree of change at, at each step and then the cause, the efficient cause of the change. But there's a question as to whether you need uh, this other thing called change, you know, this other, yeah, this other being or this other structure uh, that's called change. And, and as I was reading through this, I thought it's interesting to me is it seems, and, and I don't know, most people in our world don't really have the opportunity to think through the, these, these concepts in a philosophical way. 
But it does seem to me that perhaps when you look at our language, at least in the English language today, at least in the North American context, we do think of change as being something in and of itself. And we talk that way all the time. And so just this week, at I had a couple of meetings, a couple of church meetings where we had smaller groups that were preparing for our church council meeting on Wednesday. And our church is going through some changes. And our council is really spending some time uh, in prayer and, and in perceiving what is God's direction for the church and what does that mean, what kinds of things need to change, what kinds of things don't change, that kind of thing. And as part of that discussion, we were even talking about some people love change. Some people hate change. Some people, they say they don't like change, but really what it is that they don't like is the uncertainty that comes with change. And, and so in that sort of discussion, we treat change as a thing, as a now, as a thing that exists. And so some people like it and some people don't like it. And some people think they don't like it, but really what it is that they don't like is something else. And to some extent, through our language, we have almost come to that uh, conclusion that some of the medievals, but not all, had that change is a thing in and of itself. And I found that just really interesting to think through. Yeah, I love that opening this up, Chuck. I think, first of all, it is not a failure to note that the medieval philosophers, and I would even say philosophers of modernity, have failed in coming up with these nice, neat, tight boxes or categories or ways to think about change and time and place. So first of all, we failed in that there's no real simple, easy theory of thing. But I, I don't hold it against these philosophers because in pushing into the problem space, they brought a lot of light. And that was that's very helpful here. And it really sets the context. It sets the foundation for why we maybe think about things the way we do today. And for me, the big win was to see the meandering of the river. And river might be a good analogy, might be a good way to describe this journey, this process. And it might not. But thinking about it, the chapter makes the point very well, I think, that the medieval tradition in the West, especially the Christian West, but the West in general, really is starting their investigations regarding change, time, context, and the language to describe all of them. It starts from Aristotle and his, the Latin translations of Aristotle's natural philosophy. So Aristotle had an idea, and we're just setting the foundation here. Aristotle, for good or for ill, I think for, but Aristotle sort of divided in his thinking thoughts about the reality of things into two major groups. There were the physics, which was the study of the things that could be perceived, measured, observed, understood. We almost might call this today what could be known scientifically. And then Aristotle had a second branch, a second category of investigation of things in reality. And this would be things that uh, were beyond scientific demonstration. And so you had the physics, or what we would today call maybe scientific, but then you have the beyond the physical, which could be called, you could use accurately a label of supernatural if you wanted to. But Aristotle, the way Aristotle is characterized is the physics is the material, and then the metaphysics refers to the aspects of reality that are beyond simple proofs, simple justified true beliefs, simple models, let's say as well. And so in that context, philosophers started to think about something changing from properties. And, and so if you think about the, the Platonistic, the Aristotelian, the scholastic, maybe the better word choice here, but these classic medieval ideas of existence, you had a thing, let's say you had a statue and people would think about that thing as in some sense having an identity that moves forward in time. Chuck, you and I get together and we carve out a statue and regardless of the quality of the artistic aesthetic with it, we carve it out and there it is and it's something. It's got a certain material component to it. It's got a color. It's got all of these, it's got these properties associated with it. And these properties, some of these properties are clearly integral. In other words, you couldn't change that property of the statue and it still be the same statue. While there were other properties that seemed much more incidental or accidental maybe is the right word here. Not that 
For example, not that the color of the statue would be an accident, but if you and I had made the statue a different color, it actually would still, in some sense, be the same statue, a continuity in that, regardless of that particular accidental property. And this is the foundation. This is what people are starting to talk about when they're investigating. Now, people are going to go and diverge from this, but we want to at least start with the foundation. And if we want to think about some timelines here, we've got the 13th century is when the physics Aristotle started to be reintroduced into medieval society. Aristotle had been quote-unquote lost. He was never really completely lost, of course, but as the classical empires of antiquity fell into what became the medieval ages, Aristotle and knowledge of Aristotle really did recede, and he's reintroduced in the 13th century. And in some sense, his reintroduction might be the spark that led to things like what would become the Renaissance and maybe even the movement for modernity. So in some sense, the movement in the medieval way of thinking, it's almost at a turning point. So if you think of the movie, Chuck, if you think of the Two Towers, if, it's the, if you think about when Gandalf comes back, so uh, Gandalf was a part of the fellowship and then he fell and he was removed from the fellowship and he was gone and they had to move on without him. But then in a sort of miracle, in a sort of surprise to everybody in the fellowship, Gandalf comes back and he says this stirring line in the movie. I think it's in the book, I'm not sure, but I know it's in the movie. And he says to his friends, I have come back and that is the turning of the tide. And so this reintroduction of Aristotle and these discussions about the nature of change in time and place, maybe it's the turning of the tide in medieval thinking, even though the tide would take hundreds of years to manifest this change. So I thought that was a pretty interesting way to think about it.